Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to welcome you on behalf of the Federal Agency for Civic Education, the Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung, and the Alexander von Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society. I like to welcome you to the third lecture of our lecture series called Making Sense of the Digital Society. The general goal of the lecture series is to help broadening our understanding of the fundamental transformations that Western societies are currently undergoing. What is needed at the moment, in our view, is an educated and critical reflection on the accelerating structural changes we experience, but also on the public discourse about these changes, and not least on the individual and political responses which these public perceptions seem to suggest. If we bear in, mind, bear in mind that there are different ways of making sense of the process of digitalization, and that many, if not most, of the ways that look convincing today will seem short-sighted and parochial in retrospect. And if we bear in mind how fast the issues, narratives, and terminologies change, it becomes clear that in order to, to expand our understanding on the digital transformation and its dynamics, we ought to take a step back. As you are perhaps aware of, the social sciences have developed various tools that are meant to enable such a step a reflexive, a reflexive step back. This is the reason why our lecture series focus on social scientists, which bring together their individual theoretical approach and their empirical expertise on various aspects of digital society. Elena Esposito, our guest tonight, concerns herself, among other things, with the issue of time. Time, including society's various strategies to anticipate and control the future. Given the predictive power that we, we in the sense of critics, but also enthusiasts, <clears throat> are at present ascribing to the new generation of algorithms, Elena's research area and approach are both highly topical. This is one of the reasons why we are very glad that Elena accepted our invitation. The other reason is that her work is not only very original and insightful with regard to the overarching question that we are dealing with here, her findings are also pretty entertaining and at times even amusing, as you will see. With these remarks, I hand over to our moderator, Toby Müller, who will properly introduce Elena. Thank you, Jeanette Hoffmann one of the four speakers, um, one of the speaker of the four research directors of Humboldt Institute for Internet und Gesellschaft for your welcoming words and for your introduction to the nature and aim of this lecture series, Making Sense of the Digital Society, a joint venture with the Bundeszentrale, like you've already heard. Quite shortly to the structure of the evening, which is basically threefold, we're still kind of in the midst of the preliminaries. There's going to be, of course, the talk of our uh, guest tonight, which will be followed by about 30 minute conversation um, I'll be having with uh, Elena Esposito. And then it's going to be your turn. And uh, there's two ways you can actually participate in this evening. There's uh, microphones in the audience here, I think two of them that will be passed around for your live questions 
question, so to speak. There's also a Twitter wall, which is not going to be shown on the stage. That will be a little bit too distracting, we think. Uh, but there's two people uh, that will take care of that and read your questions or comments from that Twitter wall. So we kind of uh, go back and forth between Twitter and live comments. I'm sure you'll be uh, wanting to make by that time of the evening. Uh, after that, it's going to be drinks and uh, a little something to eat. Be quick. It's uh, gone uh, pretty fast, as the last two events have shown. We're also going to be streamed at various places in the internet. Uh, Alex TV, which is a local uh, TV station here in Berlin, and on the respective websites of the Bundeszentrale and um, the Humboldt Institute for Internet und Gesellschaft. So we're, there's a lot of surveillance here tonight, so be good. Um, this is going to be an evening of exciting opposites, I think, of highly charged concepts that seem to be maybe contradictory even at first glance only. Systems theory and transcend transcendence, sociology and economics versus lofty divination. To break it down to a core, science versus religion. Our speaker tonight is in the top rank of current systems theory. And if you're a bit familiar with its concepts, if you happen to study anything near sociology, history or literature in the 90s or later, this is most likely. If you're a little bit familiar with it, you know about the excitement I was just referring to. If you read Niklas Luhmann or anybody of his school, you had to cope with the slight, but for many blissful, humiliation that systems theory was not interested too much in the psychology of the subject, not even in its deconstruction. It was not about psychological systems, as you know, but social systems. It was analyzing systems, not interpreting them. It was very far from reading the Bible. It was, let me switch to the present tense again, systems theory is the opposite of everything that is based on faith or even creed. You may ask, is that not the case with any modern day science? Well, in the humanities, that would be at least debatable. So this is partly what our guest is going to do. Apply systems theory to prediction, even to the art of divination, der Weissagung des Hellsehens in German. Are not algorithms a substitute for God? for knowing things that humans cannot know. But is knowing the right word for that? Do algorithms actually know things? Can they learn how to learn? I'll tell you that much. Our speaker is going to deny most of that, I think. However, she will shed some light on the role of artificial intelligence, AI or KI in German, Künstliche Intelligenz, on the role AI is playing in not just predicting the future, but producing it. With algorithms being the very efficient priests of AI, of course, and so to speak. She flew in from the beautiful city of Bologna. Today, 20 minutes from Bologna, lies another beautiful city in the north of Italy, which is Modena. At the University di Modena, a Reggio Emilia, she's professor of the, at the Faculty of the Sciences della Comunicazione e dell'Economia. I'm sure you know that much Italian. But she's also professor of sociology at the University of Bielefeld, at the heart of systems theory, so to speak, even though heart might be too anthropomorphic a metaphor um, for the concepts tonight. Her uh, PhD she wrote under the guidance of Luhmann himself. After his untimely death, she also completed her habilitation at Bielefeld. She taught at the universities in New York and Japan. Her range of main topics of research is on one hand very broad, on the other extremely fit for our series here. She wrote about fashion. That's not what I mean tonight, but she did write about fashion, very funnily so, as we discussed beforehand. Die Verbindlichkeit des Vorübergehenden, Paradoxien der Mode, in 2004, at Surkamp Verlag in German. An even earlier book deals with memory and what nowadays might be called the right to be forgotten after the European Court of Justice ruled against Google in 2014. This book was also translated into Japanese, Soziales Vergessen in German, Formen und Medien des Gedächtnisses der Gesellschaft. We are getting a little bit closer to tonight's topic with a book, uh, with a book she published in 2007, Die Fiktion der wahrscheinlichen Realität, again at Surkamp. I'm quite sure we will hear something uh, tonight about the difference of probabilistic tradition and the present of algorithmic prediction. So our distinguished guest has written about memory, fashion, prediction, divination. 
there is this thread in there that Jeanette Hoffman already mentioned, and of course it is time. That's the thread maybe that is weaving through all those books I was just referring to. Die Zeit des Geldes, uh, no, Die Zukunft der Futures, Die Zeit des Geldes in Finanzwelt und Gesellschaft 2010, shortly after the financial crisis of late 2008, she also forayed into the field where the gods are, contrary to popular belief, not the brokers, but probably the algorithms. Her paper tonight is titled, you can see it, Future and Uncertainty in the Digital Society. I am very pleased to welcome now from Modena and Bielefeld, Elena Esposito. The stage is yours. Thank you so much, so much for the kind invitation, for the wonderful presentation. And I'm really, really happy and honored to be here, to be part of this great series of talks with uh, such a, well, really fascinating topic. So thank you very much again. Um, what are we talking about tonight? Well, much has been said already anticipated by my um, by the presenters, it will, we will talk about the digital society, about the um, temporal aspect, time aspect of a digital society, and about the future. And if we talk about digitality today, the ages we are referring to are, as already anticipated, not most human beings, but algorithms. So the starting claim, or the sense I would like to discuss with you, is Actually, the idea that the future of algorithm, what we are talking about, is to predict the future. It uh, seems to be a recent development uh, in the program of algorithm, like Google or even the search engines or the most um, widespread algorithms, uh, seems to be devoted since some years more to uh, predicting the future than to uh, dealing with information. The sort of the, uh, the focus that changed uh, um, subtly but quite clearly in the recent years. And especially since the recent revival of artificial intelligence uh, combining big data and machine learning, or especially deep learning, the more developed and mysterious version of machine learning. I say a revival because artificial intelligence exists, as you, everybody knows here since long, but uh, in the last 10 years it has been revived at a sort of winter where people were not talking about it anymore so much, and it really seems to de deliver amazing, wonderful um, results. And I think precisely because of the combination of new to developments, uh, deep learning and um, big data. And among the new promises uh, of um, artificial intelligence, that's this promise about prediction. Because uh, algorithm now promise actually to reveal in advance what will happen in the future. Uh, there's a research area called predictive analytics, uh, which is explicitly devoted to this. Mining data to discover, as they say, the structure of the future, which has a lot of aspect. Uh, do you discover structures, what are the structures, what, actually, what the people say in this field? And the promises are actually glittering. And many of them seem also, we have to remember, some of them can be fulfilled, actually. Um, the ability to anticipate future trends, uh, the ability to predict, uh, should help, uh, first of all, to optimize the use of resources. For example, that's, uh, of course, uh, the first field where people work on, targeting advertisements uh, to the people who are or can be interested in certain products or services, um, predictive shopping, this kind of areas. Of course, that's a lot of development, but also other more social areas, like for example, in many cases, finding, finding out in advance problems or possible fraud in the bank um, field, or preventing illness. Everybody's heard about um, precision medicines now, and the idea that now with algorithm you could prevent illness, or that's the promise that they make. But also some other promises, which seems to be realistic, but must, very much suspicious for us, focusing prevention and crime deterrence on people and groups most at risk, like mm, mm, preventing 
policing and these kind of fields. Uh, so those are the two aspects of this dependent phenomenon, glittering promises, but also worries. So the idea that the future can be known in advance is, uh, well, exciting from, the same, from one point of view, but also raises great concerns. And the interesting point is, uh, seems to me, that the concerns, the worries uh, that we have with algorithm and prediction are not related only with the case that the algorithm doesn't work, but also, and even more, with the cases where algorithms work. Because on the one hand, one fears that algorithmic prediction can be wrong. So it makes fundamental mistakes, and we don't get the prediction is mistaken. Uh, but on the other hand, also correct prediction raises worries. The idea is that if the guidelines of algorithm are followed and if they are effective, there's the fair the algorithmic prediction might lead to so-called preemptive policies. Policies which deprive the future of its open, open possibilities for all people involved, for the people targeted by the algorithm, but even for the decision makers. I will go back to that um, later in my talk. Um, so what I would like to discuss with you today is are these both aspects. So the, and from a slightly different point of view, which already has been anticipated. So um, the idea that um, the enthusiasm about the predictive power of algorithm and the concerns about the consequences of this prediction are, I think, both legitimate, legitimate and both motivated. The reason to have enthusiasm and great expectation and worries but I think they are partly misguided. Uh, because I think that for good, good and for bad, algorithmic prediction is actually very different from the idea of prediction that's most familiar to us, which is basically an idea, a meaning of prediction, which is relatively recent and established itself, as we said, in modern society since the 18th century. And the idea of prediction which is guided and oriented by the idea of probability and probability calculus, as Toby already anticipated. The point is that when the forecasting agent is an algorithm and not a human being anymore, as we are used to have, then procedures and criteria are different and also the results of the problems change. Algorithm prediction allows to do things that would be impossible for human beings even if we are equipped with the tools of statistics. So that's a, a, a big opportunity, but also raises different um, new conceptual problem we should be able to face. That's a general um, frame. So to understand what you're talking about, how do algorithms work? So the catch word in this field that everybody knows, everybody talks about, is big data. And the, the idea is that big data should inaugurate an area of the bound, abundance of data, therefore big data. But not only that, many, many data and also virtually unlimited computing capabilities. Therefore, big data have to be connected with, well, algorithms able to deal with all this data. And the idea, I now explain a little the narration in this field. The idea is that algorithm can collect and use all data about, about a phenomenon, the so-called statistical universe. In the field, they say the big data, they use all the data in the universe. Uh, N, the number of the universe, is all in this field. So the, for this reason, that the claim is, they don't need to select samples. Usually we have the universe, we sample the universe. Algorithms don't, sa don't sample anything, they use all the data, big data. Therefore, because they use all data, the claim is the algorithm should be able to provide certain and objective information. Well, free from the subjectivity and arbitrariness of our procedures. Because algorithm, that's a claim, consider all cases, they don't sample, but also and above all, because they don't need to refer to models or to theory to interpret these cases. Algorithms don't use theory, don't use models. That the idea is they just discover, they look at all the data, look at the structure of the data, and discover what they call correlations. Correlations is a big um, issue in the field of um, this kind of research. Because correlations should reveal the meaning and the consequence of a phenomenon regardless of any theory. 
um, a highly quoted, quoted everywhere sentence by um, Chris Anderson back in 2008 on Ward. With enough data, the numbers speak for themselves. You don't need theory, just look. You just have to look and see which patterns computers can abstract, can find in the ocean of data. There's a big ocean, the ocean of big data. You look what, what's going on there, you look for correlation, you find the patterns, and they're simply there. You just have to look for them. So that's why, in this kind of discourse, the results would be basically descriptions, there would be statements, not causal explanations as we're used to, to deliver. Well, as people say in the field, there is no need to know why it comes to a given result, only what it is. We move from why to what. Or, another quote from King Anderson, in the digital world, correlation supersedes causation. We don't care about the causes, we just want to know what's going on. Uh, of course, this is, as you might have heard in my presentations, extremely controversial and, and extremely debated. A, everybody's discussing about that. Uh, but my point is here is uh, slightly different. Um, my point is uh, that actually most of these things are really happening, uh, even if the hype is probably exaggerated. But uh, my point is that, that uh, even if the technology is extremely advanced, extremely new and amazing, developed, the attitude underlying this discourse about big data is not actually so new. If you look at people describe, how people describe what you can do with big data, it's not something completely new, but rather it seems to be, seems to me that algorithmic prediction, as it is described by big data theorists, actually resembles something which is not new, but is actually very old. It sort of revives a very ancient divinatory attitude. Divination, as it was produced in the Middle East, Mesopotamia, most of all in Greece, but mostly developed in very elaborated way in the Chinese world, where divination was a really, really important reference. Um, so the idea was that in ancient times, the future appeared unknowable to human beings, but not to divinity, not to God. As today, in a sense, the future seems to be unknowable to you, humans, but not to algorithms. Algorithms can know the future. We cannot, but algorithms can. And there are a lot of parallelism between the procedure of algorithm and the tradition, the practices of divination. For example, like algorithm, algorithms, divinatory procedures were guided by precise techniques, which rigidly provided the number of steps to be taken without any arbitrariness. And in both cases, in divination and the algorithms, there are programs, like software programs, but also practical programs by divinatory practices, that, like scientific practices, do not want to explain or to understand phenomena, just to deal with them. In ancient time, you didn't claim to understand the phenomena. It would have been sort of a heretic, in a sense. That's God knows how things go. You just want to, to know how to deal with them. You don't need to understand. And algorithms, we know, they don't try to understand, it's not their, their task. Um, and that made sense because divinatory societies relied on the assumption that the world they had to face were governed by cosmic logic and by a basic order. There was an order governing the entire cosmos, but human beings, we, with our limited capabilities, with our capacity, we are not able to grasp this order. As today, we can understand that the procedures of self-learning, of deep learning algorithms. There's an order, but we cannot grasp it, but still the world is there. And as for algorithm, in divination, the goal was not to understand the phenomena, but to get, to get direction that would allow well, the person asking for divination to coordinate with the superior order. The idea was that the whole universe was articulated in a network of correspondences, exactly the correspondences we found now in algorithm discourses. The ones that, for example, Michel Foucault described in the first part of Le Molle Shows, the, a world where everything was co were correlated with something else. And these correspondences uh, could be captured identifying configuration and patterns, just the patterns that are the real topic now in algorithms, in different phenomena. In the ancient world, the idea was, for example, that uh, the walnut maple has the same shape as the human brain. The human face reproduces the map of the sky. The foliage of tree resembles flying bird. 
And the idea was that it cannot be by chance. There must be a reason. There's a pattern, must have a, a, a meaning that we just have to try to um, get in touch with. So from correlations, with divinatory technique, one could draw the, the directions on the decision to be taken or on future events. Because if you look what the patterns are in the world, you can learn from them, which, was, which is the best way to, to, to decide or, or to act. The point is that if you look at it, in this ancient worldview, the idea of anticipating the future, or the idea of predicting the future in advance, was actually entirely plausible. Because the assumption underlying the entire, entire construction was that the future existed and was determined. The challenge was just, just get to know it. The future, the image of time and the relationship with, relationship with the future were very different from the one we have in modern society, and even more in our contemporary society. In well, ancient time or in divinatory worldview, the basic temporal distinction was the distinction between the dimension of God and the dimension of human beings, between eternitas and tempus. Eternity, eternitas, was the dimension of God, of higher entities, who knew all events. From the perspective of uh, uh, eternity, you can, know the pres you can know the present, the past, and the future. Or indeed, from this perspective, the very difference between the past and the future basically dissolved. Because for an all-knowing God, all events basic were contemporary, were all accessible, because all times were contemporary from this point of view of eternity. The difference between the past and the future was not a divine, divine, divine distinction, but pertained only to the limited perspective of human beings. We human beings live in tempus, and tempus, we have the distinction between the future and the, and the past in a present that immediately disappears. But the idea was, in the ontological real dimensions, the unknowable future was no less determined, no less determined than the past. Only we human, human beings cannot access this. We cannot know what, uh, what's, uh, uh, what will happen in the future. But it's determined, it's already decided. And therefore, divination from this point of view was completely rational. Because divination offered a complex of procedure and techniques that made it possible to glimpse, in a sense, this already determined future. The future existence was there, but we cannot see that. A divination offered techniques that allowed us to see something, or had some indication about what's already decided and will happen in the future. So that's a way of seeing time that actually has its kind of rationality, it has a possibility. It's not irrational. And it's actually very plausible, but it's not our way of seeing time. It's not the image of time of the, of the modern world, and even less, as I said, of our contemporary society. Our concept of time has a very different way of seeing time in general, and especially the future. And something we really are, uh, for us, is really important. We wouldn't want to give up. So for us, the future is open. The future is an open field, which today, in the present, in advance, cannot be known, of course, by human. We cannot know the future, but not even God could know the future in advance, because the future, basically, for us, does not exist. The future doesn't exist in advance because it's produced by our action and by our present behavior, so that the future cannot be known for basic reasons. The future, in the description, is not a given, it's not a series of things or things already decided, but rather, as uh, Luhmann and Kozelek described, is an horizon. An horizon that moves away as we try to approach it and therefore can never be reached. We cannot know the future as we can reach an horizon. It moves away, so it can basically not be grasped. This doesn't mean that we cannot be prepared for the future. We can do a lot to be prepared for the future, but not because it can be known in advance. What can we know about the future is not the future itself, but only, in a sense, the present image of the future. We can know and we can get more and more information about our expectations and the information that, uh, on which they are based. Those are data, data that exist, that are observable, and that's something you can investigate to get to gather more detailed and reliable information to get better preparation for the future. That's how modern prediction has developed. 
We don't, nobody expects to predict the future in advance because for basic reasons that's impossible, but prediction in modernity is rather the form of planning. Uh, the equivalence prediction is a way of preparing the present to face in a controlled way a future that is and remains always uncertain, uncertain because it's open and as an open future cannot be other than uncertain as we see in the title of the talk. So since modern age, the tools that we use to address, to prepare for the future is not divination anymore, but it's um, the calculus of probability. That is exactly with the uncertainty of the future. The uncertainty cannot be overcome. And the calculus doesn't promise to know the future in advance. It doesn't promise to reveal how, uh, today what will happen tomorrow, but rather to calculate the lack of knowledge of the present about the future. 40%, 27%, what we don't know about the future, but that we can know, we can prepare to, and that's something we should be able to elaborate in order to decide rationally, even under uncertainty. Uncertainty is something you cannot escape, but we can deal with that. We can deal with our lack of knowledge. Therefore, when we decide, the decision can be rational and good grounded, even if the future remains, of course, unknowable. This approach, the approach guided by probability calculus and by the idea of uncertainty was and still is the basic of the scientific and technological attitude of modernity. It's the, the, the basis of um, the scientific research in a sense, which means by uh, the base of the same um, attitude and development that now produce the most advanced techniques of artificial intelligence and machine learning. So that's the strange point, because these techniques, artificial intelligence, machine learning, actually use statistical tools, statistical tools derived from probability calculus. But now, as we've seen in the predictive analytics, now they, they promise to predict the future. So they promise to, this, to do something that basically contradicts the assumption of the open, unpredictable future. And that's... A, a strange contradiction that I would like shortly to discuss with you tonight. How does this claim, the claim to predict the future, reconcile with the ontological setting, in a sense, of the modern world, which is still, in many cases, still a share? Or how are algorithmic prediction and probabilistic tradition connected and distinguished? If uh, algorithms use statistical tools, but they promise to do something which basically is not compatible with the probabilistic tradition. They are actually very different if they use similar tools. And if you talk to the people in machine learning, it's, for them it's absolutely clear that they do something very different from the people in the same department in the other room that still do statistics. And the tools are the same. Because in a sense, statistics wants to contribute to know the world by activating a procedure that is actually very similar to the classical Galilean method of uh, scientific research. You insert past data into the model and then use the model to predict future data. You check if the, the, the prediction is accurate, so you check the accuracy of the model and eventually correct it. So the way of using the past and testing the future in a statistical procedure uh, is still devoted to a traditional goal, which is explanation. If you're a statistic, you want to explain the world using these procedures. For machine learning, on the contrary, the, what the purpose is completely different. The purpose of machine learning is not to understand how the phenomena were produced, is not to elaborate a model that explains the phenomenon. In many cases, if you work with algorithms, you do not even know if there can be a model. And the machine, in any case, operates without a model. The goal of algorithmic processing is not truth, but as people in the field explicitly said, it's just predictive accuracy. You do not want the truth, you want to, to, to deliver good predictions. And this attitude toward the future reveals the fundamental difference between the probabilistic and the algorithmic approach. Statistics, as we saw, um, use samples based on a limited amount of specifically chosen data. In statistics, you sample, you don't use the universe, and you do that in order to explain the statistical universe. In a sense, statistics produce forecasts on the average of the elements or subjects involved. 
That is, in statistics, you produce results that correspond to nothing specific and to one, no one in particular, but should help to understand the general phenomenon. So we know nobody has 1.4 children. But that's how the average produced by statistics and very much discussed um, sound in many cases, that a lot of jokes about uh, how statistical um, results are implausible, but they are very useful for us. Um, algorithm procedures do something completely different. They don't sample, as we said, they use all data, big data, n is all, but they produce no general results. Where the, the average should generate, everybody should have a sort of aspect of the average. In the case of algorithms, it's completely different. They use all data, but the result is not general, it's the opposite. Uh, algorithm claim to indicate what can be expected for a specific subject at a given time on the basis of this correlation they found in the data. Nothing is general, everything is extremely individual. Um, and in this, look at these aspects again, we can see that algorithm procedure basically, even in this case, reproduce a divinatory model. Because also divination did not respond to an abstract interest in the future, but responded to very practical questions. When one asks for a divinatory response, one asks questions like, how should I, a particular individual, not an average, me, uh, should I decide and how should I behave today to be the most favorable condition tomorrow? Uh, what is the best time to start a battle or to sow wheat? Will my marriage be successful? Very, very focused personal um, questions. And that's what the divinatory respon response allowed to decide. It was used to primarily to make punctual and individual predictions. Div divinatory predictions were always individuals. And also in predictive analytics, if you look at it, the purpose of the calculation is not to describe anything general, but to give an indication which should be specific and as accurate as possible. Um, a quote from a book in uh, predictive analytics, whereas forecasting, forecasting is a statistical forecasting, estimates the total number of ice cream cones to be purchased next month in Nebraska, predictive analytics tell you which individual Nebraskan are more likely to be seen with a cone in hand. So for each of us, what we will do, that, that's a claim of the, which can, can be we're fascinating and scary at the same time, of course, the claim of this diff, completely different kind of prediction. And this is the main difference between the traditional statistics and this new development in machine learning and predictive analytics. Digital techniques, as I said, abandon the statistical idea of the average man. The average man or the average person, human being, of which all elements of the population should be more or less imperfect replicas. We also more or less correspond to the um, average model. The new frontier of prediction or the new frontier of customization guided by algorithm would lie in something completely different. In a movement, as they say, from the search for universals, which nobody cares about anymore, to the understanding of variability. Or a quote again, now in medical science, we don't want to know just how cancer works. We want to know how your cancer is different from my cancer. Or in the general sense, individualization trumps universals. No universal, everything individual now. How can it work? Because it actually works. That example um, is about cancer. You know that the most uh, uh, amazing successes are in, in um, predictive medicine. So these techniques actually work in some cases, not always, and we'll go to that. But it basically, when it works, it works because algorithms are themselves part of the world in which they operate. They observe the world, they deal with the world from within, not from the outside, referring to the model. That's the difference. The model is something outside you put on data, and the algorithm is inside the data, works inside the field it, develops, it, it uh, describes. And this changes the meaning of prediction. When algorithms make prediction, they do not see in advance an, an, an independent external given. They don't see the future which is given independent of the algorithm. They don't see the future which is not yet there. It would be impossible. Algorithm, as Dominic Cardon says, manufacture the future with their operations. Therefore, Algorithm, that's the claim, can anticipate, can predict the future. They cannot predict something which is already there because it doesn't exist. 
but they, in a sense, algorithm can see the future that will be there as the result of the intervention of the algorithm themselves. I'll make some example. So, the uh, predictions by algorithm, as I said, are individual and are contextual. The, they uh, refer only to the specific item they address, which individual in Nebraska will, have a, uh, will eat an ice cream in August, or what it is. Um, for example, the algorithm used in uh, predictive shopping, they do not say how consumer trends will be in the next season, or they don't see which product will increase or lower the market share. They don't refer to a, a trends in general. As I said, all individual contextual things. Um, instead, they anticipate which specific products and a specific individual cons consumer will be willing to buy. And as we know it, in many cases, they predict this before the individual himself chooses them, and in many cases, before he even knows of these products. Uh, the, the person is not even aware of its need, but the algorithm produces that need and then satisfies the need, in a sense. Uh, and we know how it works. Um, but as I said, um, the, I might not be, know, be, uh, be aware of this product, that this product exists, but the algorithm can identify this, uh, well, I sort of exaggerated, but sort of the idea. Uh, this product is something compatible with my features and the, my past choices and the past choice of the famous people similar to you. You know how it goes, it goes with praxis, they have data about me and they compare it with data of people which for some reason the algorithm finds similar to me, uh, out of, um, on the basis of criteria which are often unscrutable. We don't know how the algorithm decides that, but they gather all this information and, and very often they, um, they are right. And we don't know how this, the uh, algorithm comes to the decision, but in many cases it works. And the, 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 the suggestions by algorithm are not like we, uh, we know now with uh, Amazon that uh, you like this book and they propose a book which is often much too similar, so it's completely useless in a sense. But now the algorithm do predictions which are much more surprising uh, and potentially informative. For example, the user bought a Barbie doll and the system offers an adventure travel to Morocco or something completely different. And me, the person, didn't even know that this kind of travel exists. But apparently, if the prediction of the algorithm is correct, the person buys this, uh, this travel. Uh, and if, if the prediction is right, it's not, as I said, because the algorithm saw the future in advance. Also because in this case, the person didn't know about this, this uh, travel, so it wouldn't be possible to see in the future uh, that the future would not exist without the intervention of the algorithm. So the algorithm suggests the project, product to the future buyer, and thereby the algorithm produces the future and thereby confir confirms itself. The algorithm is right because it produces the future that confirms its prediction. Or not, because not always people accept, accept the suggestion of the algorithm, but in that case, the algorithm learns. If I accept the, the suggestion, the algorithm is confirmed, and okay, uh, he's right. But uh, if I reject it, the algorithm will learn from the experience, and in any case, make the best use of its resources. And the idea is, in the broad idea of prediction, that should happen not only in these cases of predictive shopping, but in all other cases. And especially in the particularly scary case of crime prevention. So the prediction, as we know from movies and so on, should allow to act before an individual at risk begins a criminal career. Because the algorithm can profile the people who are at risk of committing crimes, and you can know it before this acts. So the idea is, in this construction, that the algorithm, they can guess right or can guess wrong, but often they guess right, but in any case, it should always be effective. Not necessarily right, but effective. Because even when the anticipation of algorithm are not realized and people don't follow the prediction, the algorithm that's a claim should offer the best possible prediction given the available data. So that even the failure of prediction with HEPs should contribute to, uh, to um, improve the future performance of the algorithm. So the algorithms are maybe not always right, but they're always effective. That's the claim. And actually, it sounds maybe fascinating or not, but uh, the point is that's not always the case. We have a lot of research showing that actually is not necessarily what happens. Algorithms are not even always effective. 
For example, Katie O'Neill, in a book that probably maybe some of you already read because it's very, very much discussed, these weapons of mass destruction, um, shows how in many cases it doesn't work. Algorithms uh, are not effective, not only because they are wrong, but exactly because they are right. So the problem is, that even when correct, algorithmic prediction can prove ineffective. What Adrian McKenzie calls the production of prediction affects the effectiveness of the prediction. And this can lead us to self-fulfilling circularities, like in the case I buy the, project, the product because the algorithm proposes to me, but also at the same time, as a negative size, to so-called preemptive policies, policies which limit the future possibilities for all the people involved. And the reason is actually quite basic, because however refined your techniques and your tools, you cannot see a future that depends on what you do following the prediction. So in a sense, about the future they produce, algorithms are blind, are and remain blind. And this is the dark side of the performativity of prediction, which actually also reproduced a well-known circularity of divina divinatory procedure. But in this circularity, in the case of divination, was an advantage. In, in the case of our use of algorithm, uh, can become risk to become a very serious difficulty in the use of algorithms. I think, for example, we think about divination of the case, the case of Oedipus. The example of Oedipus shows, in the clearest way, that divinatory responses, responses tend to be self-fulfilling. Uh, everything that Oedipus did in order to avoid the pre-announced outcome contributes to the inevitable conclusion. He tries every what he can to avoid it, but at the end he kills his father and he lies with his mother. That's unavoidable. Uh, but in the ancient world, it made sense because this inescapability of the prediction confirmed in the ancient worldview the existence of a controlled and predetermined higher order. The order, it's not up, up to now to decide what the order of the world is already decided, the future is already decided, and every what we do, know it or not, will confirm something which is inescapable because it's realized to be higher order. The future already exists in the present. It was already decided. Even if we, humans, don't know it, we have to face uncertainty. But we live in a different semantic. We live still in an open future. And in our semantic, this circularity results in actually problems, in feedback loops, and very often in a serious inability to learn, which is the main problem of algorithms. Again, Katie O'Neill says, algorithms are tools for behavioral modification that confirm their findings on the reality, reality they create, which means that the algorithm only see the reality that results from their intervention, and the problem is that they do, do not learn from what they cannot see because it, it has been canceled by the consequence of the algorithm. They cannot see the world without the intervention of the algorithm. I make some examples. So, um, the use of algorithm, that would be the problem, produces a kind of second order blindness that really affects the way we do, deal with these um, tools. Therefore, and that's the reason why, the, the difficulty of algorithmic prediction are actually different from the difficulty you would have with statistical forecasting. The problems of algorithms do not depend on sampling problems, on data shortage, or on the loose use of wrong or misleading models, like in the case of statistics. Pro algorithms don't care about that. They don't have these worries. Uh, they never have data shortage. They have big data that would they claim. Uh, they don't sample right, wrong because they don't sample at all. Uh, and they don't use wrong models because they don't use any models. So the difficult algorithms are not the classical difficult that we know, but they are different and not necessarily less um, um, worrisome. Uh, they depend on specific problems of machine learning, and in particular on the way algorithms address, which is our topic here, the relationship between the future and the past and the present. Algorithms as everybody knows, have seen how machine learning worked, uh, works, are trained by maximizing their performance on a set of some so-called training data. So they learn from this data, they come from the past and correspond to the available experience of training data. But what they have to predict, the predict predictive effectiveness of algorithm, 
depends on something different, depends on their ability to perform well on different data. The previously unseen real data that would be the object of the prediction of the algorithm. And the real problem of prediction is that training data and the training algorithms learn very well and real data are as different as the past is different from the future. But algorithms only know the, tra the training data and the difference between the two sets, uh, training data and real data, gives rise to a number of difficulties uh, which we often are the keep to face. And that's are the basic problem, the, uh, well, uh, more serious problem of algorithmic prediction. For example, algorithms tend often to learn so well the training examples uh, that they become blind for every other item. For example, the algorithm, the real example that I um, get from the list on the feed, the algorithm learns so well to interact with right-handed user, with right-handed user to be trained with, that it doesn't recognize a left-handed person as a possible user. This is a typical case of a problem of algorithm. And the problem in this case is called overfitting. Oops. And overfitting has been defined as a bugbear of machine learning. The big, big problem that really everybody has to face is always overfitting, some version of overfitting. Closing, how can we say about that? How, then can, how can this condition that the past is different from the future, nevertheless we want to predict and that, that the algorithm become blind by their own effectiveness in a sense, um, how can it be addressed? How can we say on a theoretical level about these problems? Uh, not the old solution, but of course we can say something. First, I think part of the problem is that the learning algorithm, self-learning or deep learning algorithm, they learn, of course they learn a lot, but they do not learn to learn. And this learning to learn is often the fundamental component of empirical learning and the basis of our human ability to generalize. And that produces very concrete problems. Uh, for example, I make an example um, about predictive policing. And I use an argument by Bernard Arcour about the concrete cases of using policing in the for, to um, profile person to uh, reduce crime, especially in Chicago. But in the United States, the programs are already quite widely used. And Ar Arcour argues that if profiled persons, the person the algorithm finds, are less responsive to policy change than not profiled persons, then concentrating crime prevention measures on the people at risk identified by algorithms can be counterproductive. The point is that the algorithm profiles persons rightly, probably, they're persons at risk to commit crime, but in many concrete situations, you think about uh, that Chicago, about, uh, well, this privileged portion of the population, the algorithm provides person that actually, even if they are at risk, even if you have measures preventing crime, they can really change their behavior because they have, often they have no choice. So they are so bad off uh, that they commit crime anyway, if, if you uh, try to prevent uh, the crimes. While at the same time, while you are following the, uh, the indication of algorithm, other areas of population where possibly surveys and prevention could be effective uh, remain uncovered. And therefore, it has, it has been shown, actually the algorithm were right in the profiling this person. But if you use algorithm, overall crime increases. It apparently was the case in Chicago. So crime increases because surveys has moved elsewhere. And the, the mistake in this case is not to learn from experience, not to learn to learn. The mistake in this case is not to consider that the experience that you have with your measures could lead not only to strengthen or weaken confidence in the starting hypothesis for people who know a little probabilistic that all these algorithms are basically Bayesian. So the prior hypothesis and the experience we use to confirm or disconfirm the prior hypothesis. But that's what algorithm can do, but they cannot actually discover different hypotheses using experience. That's what Katie O'Neill uh, criticizes. She criticizes the preemptive effect of predicting policing, claiming that the problem is that people using these measures, they set the target in advance and they say, I try to eradicate crime. But they, but they're, they're, um, thereby, they become blind to another possible thing they could learn. For example, the idea that the, they could use the, the information gathered by the policy measures to try to build the relationship in the neighborhood. They could shape the target differently out of the experience they have with their predictive measures. And that the algorithm apparently is not, is not able to deal with them. So in a sense, 
what we should be able to introduce in programming algorithms is something that we know very well. The, the idea that the experience of the past does not necessarily lead to expecting the future the same or similar things, rightly or wrong. That was, for example, Rainer Kozelek in his historical studies shown very clear. Uh, you know, the, his wonderful studies on the modern sense of time and the idea of the open future, and actually shows that our modern sense of time goes in a different direction, expecting the same in the future to happen. It's the opposite. We could say that the more you know the past, the more you can expect the future to be different. And that's what happened in modern society. The study of the past opened the future. Um, historiography uh, developed together with the idea of the openness of the future. Uh, a complex knowledge of the past can actually lead to expect unpredictable aspects of the future. And this is something you can expect, something which actually shapes our relationship with the, with the world with the future. We can use experience to anticipate surprises, not only to anticipate things that we already know. That's the problem also with the comparison with the parallelism between divination algorithms. Because digital prediction works in an incomparably more complex, reactive, and unstable social environment than divination. In divinatory semantics and in the ancient worldview, the idea of predicting a predetermined future could be plausible. But in our society, and in modern society, even more in our digitized society, um, the intensity of communication is such that any prediction, even correct prediction, even more a correct prediction actually, is anticipated, commented, and reworked. And this produces new unpredictable complexity. The prediction makes the world it tries to predict more complex. And this complexity is that something the prediction cannot actually know in advance. Uh, therefore, I think that also to overcome the specific blind blindness of smart algorithms, we need theoretical work. Well, the work that people are doing, machine learning is doing is wonderful. We can learn a lot uh, as, as well, sociologists or philosophers about that. But a kind of theoretical prediction is, uh, theoretical reflection is really needed to deal with this development and take into account the complex range of possible consequences. Thank you very much. So thank, thanks a lot, um, Elder, for this wonderful and insightful talk about um, yeah the difference between what algorithms do and uh, what probabilistic um, prediction used to do, so to speak. Um, of course, when we, like in the next 30 minutes, I think we will mainly talk about the downsides um, of uh, algorithmic uh, prediction or what does not work as well as it should work, maybe. Uh, most of the things you mentioned um, already um, in your talk. Um, you mentioned that you, you used a very big uh, term, truth. Right? You said um, algorithmic prediction is not about truth, uh, it's more about efficiency. Or uh, if we like, switch a little bit into um, the terminology of systems theory, you might say it's not about intelligence, but it's about communication. Right? So uh, algorithms um, are not like people, but they move within systems, so to speak. So maybe it's the whole concept that sort of frames this evening of artificial intelligence, maybe a term we have to revise. Should we rather talk about AC, and that don't mean air condition, like cooling this discourse, but um, um, artificial communication in that respect. Is it time for a new term there? Well. Uh, 
definitely it's time for a new term. And uh, well, of course, I would be very happy to talk about artificial communication, but that's because I'm a sociologist. Mm -hmm. And okay. uh, well, I, 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 well, I propose something in this direction that I find that people listen to that. It's not that find, well, uh, meaningless, but usually people, don't, well, well, you know, the way I interpret communication, it was because at the beginning, I'm a sister theoretician, so I use communication, the, the meaning of uh, Luhmann, uh, Niklas Luhmann, mm -hmm. which is even in sociology, even in communication study, not mainstream. So you wouldn't expect people in machine learning to accept something we're not even sociologists accept. But that doesn't um, exhaust the meaning of your question, because, well, well I, I think that I would be enthusiastic to talk about communication, but, uh, uh, that's the second step. The first step, which almost everyone in the field actually now accepts, is the artificial intelligence that it doesn't work. Someone proposed to move to machine learning, but that's not so effective and it's not so sexy as an idea as well. Mm -hmm. and so it's not difficult to find a different metaphor. But actually, if you look at this strange, actually fascinating thing, but also strange thing, and that we talk of a revival of artificial intelligence in the last 10 years, and there are even, and not only of intelligence, but also of a clearly analogy to the uh, human way of, of elaborating information. In machine learning, the, um, the, the models we are more effective are now new, uh, neural networks. Mm -hmm. So not only the idea of consciousness, of uh, thoughts, but also like the hardware, the brain should be the model for that. So a really clear analogy to human processing. And, but it happens at the same time where, and the people also say that, the procedure of the machine are becoming more and more distant from human processing. For example, uh, I don't want to make it too long, but... Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, can we, um, well, I don't know if uh, people use this Google Translate or translation process. I do use them a lot. And now they are actually very good. They still make funny mistakes, and it's nice to use them, so, but they're actually very useful. And they were not 10 years ago. And everybody says uh, translation programs have become effective and they can have these good results when the programs abandon completely the idea to produce machines that translate like us. So I mean, the algorithm translating like English into Chinese, they don't know English, they don't know Chinese, and the programmers, they do English, but they don't know Chinese either. Or they can have the machine translated Chinese into Russian or whatever, so neither the programmers nor the machine know the language. And the, the way they produce these results is, well, you say, they could well, put in a formula. In all these fields, also algorithm producing text, algorithm communicating, um, well, that's not only my observation, everybody agrees that the machine can produce something that resembles very closely the products of human intelligence, and they did it when they, in the moment that they gave up the idea of reproducing the way of, of uh, well, uh, human intelligence work. I very often I quote this uh, Blumenberg idea that uh, human beings learn to fly when they abandon the idea that the, the, the airplane something would flap their wings like birds. So we can make airplanes when we abandon the idea they should resemble birds. So algorithms improve the less they know, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's interesting because I think there's other fields um, where I think that algorithmic prediction um, or, you know, let's call it by the name, you mentioned it too, collaborative filtering, but um, Amazon uh, has it done for more than 20 years and uh, what has gotten really popular on um, platforms like Spotify, of course. Discover Weekly is one of the um, really most popular lists in all of the world now. It's called Dein Mix der Woche, I think, uh, in German. It's entirely based on uh, uh, algorithms um, and yet I think it's produced an awful lot of similarity. Mm -hmm. It uh, has a tendency to mollifying sounds, to elevator sounds. I do listen to a lot of music that might go down as elevator music, electronic music, some jazz music, but not only, but everything I listen to and I check it out every week um, has 
to me um, resembles resembles music I already know. I don't know it by name, but it produces a lot of similarity, and it completely ignores what a good radio DJ used to do. It used to surprise us. It uh, used to produce things and effects and emotions that are based on what uh, creative science calls serendipity, um, which is totally crucial to innovation. And I think that is not only an aesthetic problem, because I'm a man you know, of the arts, it might also be an economic problem in the end. What would you say to that? That this whole, you were talking about similarity too as a concept, and maybe as one of the prime flaws of mm -hmm. algorithmic uh, prediction. Yeah, flaws or not, because as you said, <laughs> that's a good example of a case where, the, where I think where we, should, we should be worried about many aspects, but mm -hmm. this worry shouldn't uh, cancel the amazement about the unbelievable results, because the algorithm would do wonderful things, but wonderful, or even what we don't like, they are really amazed that the machine can do that. So they are really, really extremely effective. But uh, that's, that, first I have to say something we can be a misunderstanding. I mm -hmm. think machine doesn't have to be intelligent, and the, 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 the mm -hmm. work the, they work better the less the programs that try to reproduce the forms of, of human intelligence. Okay, but it doesn't mean there's no intelligence that work. For example, the, pro, the, um, the example you mentioned, as many others, algorithm works so well, we could say because they are able, became able in the last year, to in a sense to parasitically use the intelligence of the users. Well, crowd sourcing so are a good example of that. But think about, for example, the, the, always the, the first example is Google. Google was, is still the best uh, research engine, if you don't look at Bing or these kind of things, but it, it was able to be much more effective than the other search engines like Yahoo and Alta Vista, some can remember that. No? Um, because Google learned to switch the idea. So the machine was not intelligent itself, but learned, you know, everybody knows how page rank works. Hmm? So the, the way Do you? of... Uh, no, well, I don't know what it works, I, not okay. at all, but you know the basic logic. Okay. You know, so that's, well, page rank looks at the links. No? So the, the, the results that go, go um, higher in your rank of the results are the ones that were more linked or backlinked by the people there. So it means the algorithm wouldn't... The algorithm is not intelligence, but learns what, from what the people do to give us the best results. The previous search, search engines are, uh, were based on semantic trees that said that the machine, in a sense, understood what was going on and gave the result out of this own understanding of the semantic meaning of the things. And Google gave up completely that. The machine had no semantic trees at all and learned everything from the behavior of the user. Does it mean that's an example of what we are saying? Well, the machine is not intelligent, it's very stupid, but it's not extremely intelligent because the machine uh, learns, and that's the same in many other programs, to learn in a sense to learn from the behavior of the users what the relevant points are. So that's, that's why you need big data. But you need something that gives the machine in the web clues on differences which are produced by human beings. Yeah, there's always, um, or there is something happening in terms of resistance with some people called obfuscation in the mm -hmm. net, right? That people like things they do not like, actually. That they um, pretend to be shopping something they don't want. Mm -hmm. That, um, like on Facebook, they would like the AFD here in Germany where they actually don't. Uh, it's just something to... Um, actually play with the machine, they call it. I'm not sure, it's not a mass phenomenon yet, but it's still an option mm -hmm. uh, people have of kind of obfuscating their traces, um, obfuscating their profile, preventing um, big machines from knowing more about them than their partners uh, mm -hmm. do. You know, that's a, a, a well-known um, examples. How does algorithms cope with that, actually, with the subjective end? I know that's something that uh, system theory is not that much interested in, but there's still no. the possibility possibility of um, right. actually resisting um, to leave true traces. No, well, actually, system theory is not this piece of theory, it's not interesting <laughs> subject. It, well, of course, that's a, the base reference for everyone. It's not the object of sociology. I mean, if you yeah. want to... Well, yeah. The idea is that if you want to recognize the 
primary role of um, what we say psychic system of individuals. Mm -hmm. You have to say the outside society. Outside society, what means are not relevant. They're extremely relevant. They're so relevant, the society cannot determine them. But mm -hmm. that's because it is a direction. But um, yeah, obfuscation is a great topic. It is a great topic because, well, first, the problems people react to are not produced by the algorithms. But obfuscation is particularly used in privacy debate because, as you know, the real problem you have to face and nobody knows how to deal with that are privacy problems. How algorithm use can gather information, not only out of information, but of data which have no meaning for anyone. So the problem is not only that algorithm knows what I wrote in the web and ask consents for or not. The real problem is the algorithm knows a lot, a lot about me that I don't even know because it traces out of my GPS localization that people know. So, so that's a real problem. And uh, these uh, data shadows people say that everybody has in the web. And that's actually really scary for, because nobody understands it, not even the people using them. So, and obfuscation is so good because, uh, well, it works to a certain point. But the idea is so clever because uh, the idea is that in order to escape uh, being profiled in the web, you don't try to hide your traces. You produce more. That's how the situation works. The idea, I don't want to be profiled by the machine, so actually, but I know it doesn't make any sense that I try to hide my traces because actually, you know, anonymity is not anonymous on the web, but the machine gets to me anyway. So the strategies completely shift the idea and react to logic to the machine, which is not human logic. Well, we, we have too many data, or it's, well, it's a different logic. And so the way to escape that is not erasing the data, but producing any time you do something on the web, which is significant for you, meaningful, you produce thousands of data which are completely relevant. And then that's, of course, completely confuses the profiling algorithms because they cannot distinguish what is good, what was real data from noise and so on. And I think it's a very clever strategy, but of course it's, it's not so easy to realize, so it has limits. But it shows that you, can, you have to think about algorithm in a different way. You made this very nice, very clean cut, um, immediately, immediately sensible distinction or opposition rather between, um, you know, probabilistic and again, algorithmic um, divination, so to speak. And you said, well, probabilistic models rely or want to um, determine the general average, so to speak. Uh, algorithmic prediction um, wants to know about the individual, right? It wants to know about your cancer, not about cancer. It wants to know whether you're going to eat ice cream, not how many people are going to eat ice cream tomorrow in Nebraska. Chris Anderson says, uh, and the famous quote, uh, uh, you quoted as well, that there is no theory to that, that the numbers speak for themselves, yet we know from um, certain cases that, of course, um, there are, if not theory, but then certainly biases mm -hmm. uh, that sort of are inscribed into the machine, so to speak, or uh, in the algorithms. Like one example would be, um, white males have been more successful in certain um, professional fields in the past, so they'll probably be more successful in the future. And that's sometimes what uh, algorithms, to put it very plainly, very simply, uh, actually do. So how are we going to fix that bias bug, uh, might want yeah. to call it? Mm -hmm. No, that's a, a big practical problem, because that's the biases, well, you know, there was, there's all this discussion. Algorithms, of course, they are completely biased. Completely, they are not neutral at all. They're, even if they're not intelligent, they don't think, they're not neutral, therefore. The results, um, everybody heard of this example of T, this, this algorithm or this sort of um, personal um, things or, uh, produced by Microsoft like one year ago. And there was a, I was a, um, um, canceled after like a day because it was this horrible sexist racial uh, so, um, results. Uh, but the, produce, the program themselves were all liberal, all Democrats. They were really horrified by the algorithm. So the algorithms are biased. Not, well, of course, they can be biased designers, which have their own interest, but even the design is not biased, the algorithm is unavoidably biased because, well, if we refer to what I was saying before, the algorithm is not intelligent, in many cases they are not, and they become intelligent using the data they get. They use the intelligence of the users. Mm -hmm. So, we are biased. 
And actually, and the, uh, the fascinating aspect is that the web is biased also in a strange way. We know fake news are uh, followed much more than the other ones. Uh, hate speech is more successful on the web. So the discourses on the web are not only biased, they're probably biased more than our out of uh, digital uh, space discourses. But uh, that's the data the algorithm have. How would you expect them not to be biased? Of course, that's, that doesn't mean that we cannot do any, nothing about it, that people try to fix it. There's a lot you can do to, to well, algorithms are not, well, they, they, think that they are not intelligent, it doesn't mean that they cannot be con controlled. For example, Google can very well protect, well, um, well pornographic, Content, it can, they can't have filters on the web. But the, the idea that algorithms are biased, I think that's something you have to accept as a, as a given and try to find a way to, to, to solve the solution. Algorithms are biased because we are biased. But if I'm informed correctly, uh, you um, mentioned Google now a couple of times, the PageRank algorithm, and I think that is um, an algorithm that has changed pretty much on a ba daily basis, as I'm yeah, informed. Yeah. Um, and of course, it's not changed by one engineer, yeah, but yeah. by a myriad, uh, a number of almost of engineers. So uh, you can't change those things, actually. Or would you say that the algorithms are just pretty much a mirror, uh, so to speak, uh, yeah. of what's going on in the web, or can you interfere with that um, as an engineer um, as, as a coder well as far as I know uh, well of course it, uh, the algorithm in Google has changed every day and it's also kept confidential because well sure. there's a search engine optimization what everybody it's tries to model. do and so yeah, yeah that's a cat and mouse game so that's unavoidable but as far as I know the logic the basic logic of Google that the algorithm learns from the behavior from, from the what governing the web is not going to be changed um, but, of course, you can do a lot to avoid the, the worst results of that. That's, uh, you can put filters and so on. But even respect, always respecting this logic, you cannot teach the algorithm to discriminate understanding. But you have to, well, the, uh, you can teach algorithm to discriminate some things, but only the things you told, that's a problem. Because this, this can work, but the algorithm learns to do only what you decided it has to learn. And that, they learn, they learn very well. But well, as, you, as you said, serendipity, as you mentioned, is not something algorithm can uh, deal with by themselves. Or if they do them, and in the case of like uh, discovering the faces on the web or so, they produce a lot of meaningful things and a lot of, of uh, garbage as well. Another downside that might be put into a formula is, um, you know, the notion of time. You uh, have been talking about uh, a lot already um, this evening, and that uh, is, um, let's say, the assumption that algorithms are um, do not like social change, or it's hard for them to take into account that social change is something that might be happening. You were talking about uh, something about it like a retro future. Right, that uh, the present future is the past future that what uh, algorithms thought was going to be the future, actually. So we're sort of trapped uh, in this model, at least in some sort of vicious circle between uh, the past and the present, which is something that is quite um, heavily at work in, again, the artistic field, where we have a lot of retro uh, phenomena, we have a lot of social retro phenomena, dominating politics, actually, wishes that go back uh, to a past that probably never existed. This would be um, one way to define uh, um, retromania, so to speak. So our algorithms another driving factor to that retromania that some of us feel we are trapped in, in many social fields. Uh, well, that's uh, um, Jeanette um, mentioned fashion, and the fashion, you know, vintage is a yeah. big phenomenon in yeah. fashion. But the interesting thing is, that fashion is, has always to be new. The meaning of fashion is being new. And the interesting thing is that if you, um, vintage is never active. If you have always been wearing these things, you are not fashionable in winter. Vintage is like rediscovering the old as something new again. And so it's something we do, but the algorithm can really very well deal with that. So the problem with algorithm is something even, even more basic, as you said. For algorithm, if they, 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 well, they predict the future as a, as, a, as a sort of a projection of the past. And that what they can do, they can do it very well, but basically not much more than that now. 
But if you talk, I talked a little with people in, or often, like the people in machine learning, they are aware of that. Mm -hmm. And I'm confident they can, for example, the problem of overfitting, which I've been mentioning in my talk, that's it. They are going to, if the algorithm is very good, learned very well, is very effective in learning with the example you gave to him, it becomes completely stupid for everything which is different. Like you are extremely biased. And there are some, uh, some um, distinctions that are circulating in the field of machine learners that show how aware they are. Because one of the problems in machine learning uh, programs is how to deal with the difference between bias and variance. So a very, very skilled algorithm is extremely biased. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't work very well. So you have to have, to have a, but if it's only a lot of variance, that we means it forgets everything every time and starts afresh every morning. Morning is not biased at all, but it's completely stupid. So it's not what you want. It's completely, well, uh, unable to control anything. But they are aware of that. Or for example, they, they say one of the discussions going on in the field is to find a trade-off between exploitation and exploration. So exploitation uses the data you have to know them as good as possible, but still be able to explore something different. The more you become an expert, you more, the more you are close, you know that, also, also human beings. And, and apparently it's something you can do with a program or algorithm to do, deal with that. They are working on that. Is that a correspondence, so to speak, to what you talked about in the context of <clears throat> preemptive policing? Mm -hmm. Like this right-hand user bias you uh, I just uh, elaborated on now would then correspond to the criminal that will not have a choice anyway but to commit the crime the algorithm chose for him to do, so to speak, or to predict uh, in that case, but sort of ignoring the unstable, um, yeah. the people on the brink, the people on the twilight. Mm -hmm. um, is that something an algorithm is able to learn? Or another kind of more ethical question would be, do we want that? Do we want yeah. a perfect uh, algorithm that actually mm -hmm. predicts or actually produces people's futures? Well, actually, that would be, I don't know if it's feasible, but it would be a, a way of making the algorithm, well, not more perfect, but more flexible. So the idea would be, uh, the problem of this, this um, um, predictive policing algorithm is not that they were wrong, the problem is they were right. What the algorithm, uh, the people the algorithm provides that people at risk are actually people at risk. And we couldn't have found them. The algorithm has quite, a, have a lot of fantasy. They find out people nobody would have, uh, because they look at this pattern, nobody would have thought about. So they are effective. The problem, in, they, they are successful what they do in a sense. But they're not effective because, because of something the algorithm couldn't know when it was working because it's something which is produced as a consequence of the algorithm. For example, that the people, yeah, you focus the prevention of these people at risk, and they don't change very much because they cannot, but at the same time, of course, you don't control other people, and they would have changed because they are not so bad off, and they are now, there's no prevention there, and then that's why crime increases. So I think the direction that the actual people are working on is so to make the, the the um, setting of the algorithm more flexible. In Bayesian term, you have this prior, and you learn if the prior is confirmed or disconfirmed. Okay, Bayesian, you go on. But in a sense, integrate that with an ability by, for the algorithm to learn from what happens as a consequence of the algorithm. Not only if it's right or wrong, the people are actually possible criminals, but at the same time, what's happening in the rest of the world which you couldn't know before using the algorithm. So it's one thing to ask if uh, algorithms may be able in the future to lose their bias, uh, so to speak, to become more flexible, to allow for more openness, uh, what actually used to be an integral part of our notion of the future uh, in the past. Uh, those are big questions to raise, but there's also another um, maybe totally opposed um, way of um, confronting uh, that problem just in case that should not happen, which would be always the ascetic approach, so to speak, of not knowing about mm -hmm. the future, of um, not letting the algorithm predict or produce 
um, what you are going to shop and so forth. What do you think? Is that going to be an option or do we just have to rely on the engineers to actually produce better algorithms that do not have those flaws we have been just talking about? Oh, well, I don't know, but I think that's the one solution, then one way doesn't prohibit the other one. Uh, well, for example, in the legal field, there's a lot of talk about it. And for example, that's you know, the, the difference between Europe and the United States. Mm -hmm. In the European Union, we are actually prohibiting things. And I think that's, well, well I, I'm not an expert on that, but I think it must be done, actually. That, that we do it in other cases, and also in the case of algorithm, why not? The, the point is just to, to, to find a way of, uh, well, some things will be, I think, rightly forbidden with the algorithms. We, but the real point is to find out why, which ones, and how. You were mentioning, for example, the right to be forgotten on Google, which is a great idea with very bad results. It simply doesn't work. Not bad results, it, that there are bad consequences. It simply doesn't work because the, the, the um, um, European norms were guided by absolutely right principles, but the, the algorithm world is so complex that basically, well, I say it's not so simple, but I say one just one thing. Um, well, the result, the first result of the, um, you try to be forgotten and say you claim you should forget me on the web. The first result, of course, that you are remembered. That's the problem of forgetting because forgetting you can't. It is difficult to, to re, well, if you try to forget something focused. It's like remember to forget, and the yeah. results are counterfeited. Mm -hmm. So that's and with the, with the web is even more. So that's because, of, yeah. So, uh, so if I think you take active part in forgetting, but if you kind of renounce uh, even forgetting or the notion of forgetting, that's what I mean by the aesthetic approach, yeah. that you actually do not take into account the algorithm for certain things at all, and you just leave it out of the question, which uh, equation, I'm sorry, which would be, yeah. as I said, quite an aesthetic approach. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's realistic or even desirable. Yeah. Um, it's just a notion I was not sure if, uh, you know, at the end, uh, like now, it actually boils down to privacy issues, right? Where the EU or um, many Europeans have sort of a different stance uh, or different views on, on privacy than, well, the rest of the world has, I guess. And where do you see the re European perspective we always like to reinforce here or to stress or to ask about? Um, is Europe going to have any say in the future of algorithm engineering? Um. Well, I'm convinced it will. We were discussing about it, and uh, um, I have the impression I already see. Uh, well, of course, there's already a difference, as we said, in the uh, attitude. Europeans are more into traditional towards privacy and protection of individual rights, where the, the United States have a more like a free speech um, priority. And uh, well, not to mention China, which is a completely different world, of course. Not that they don't have worries, they have a completely different way of dealing with these problems. But I have the impression that uh, just now, uh, now with this um, new development machine learning, what we've been discussing, um, there's a, I have the feeling, let's see, it's a, uh, there's a, a widespread idea that more theory is needed. Theory in the sense, theory as a general theory, which is still more, I think, a, a European tradition. Um, and that's something that we should be proud of and working on. I make just an example among many. Uh, everybody, peop, everybody talks now about fake news. It is a huge problem, of course, it's, and a huge and interesting problem. But the debate, not only in, in Europe, is shifts to the direction what you have been mentioning. Well, these news are fake, okay, but what is real and what is true in this field? And everybody working in sociology and communication theory knows that the difference between truth and false is nothing that can describe what happens in the media, because the media are always false in a sense, or not true in the, but that's right, they are controlled, but not because they are truth. True, that's the way, and the fake, well, we know fake is something which also is a tradition that should, with a lot of theoretical discussion that, because we all know the difference between fiction and lie. If a lie is a lie, and the fiction, fiction like novels or uh, movies, are actually not true, but they don't lie. 
And the, the debate about fake brings all this distinction on which we have a lot of tradition into this more very practical field. And that's something that I think we in Europe are much better equipped to deal with. Thank you for that first 30 minutes uh, of our conversation. Elena, now it's your turn, actually, from the audience. And I would like to start um, with a comment or a question from the audience, live, actually. Where are the microphones? They're circulating already. There's somebody just about mid, like, to my right. There's a, right, right there, please. Uh, thank you so much for your exciting talk. Um, I'm Isabella Hermann. I, um, I'm actually, among other things, um, doing research also on uh, science fiction and um, world politics, which is quite interesting because now we are arriving in the genre, right? Um, so I would be interested on your thoughts on um, AI and um, democracy. Because actually there are people saying, or this is also the spirit of uh, Silicon Valley somehow, um, that with enough data and AI you could optimize um, democracy in a sense of the um, well-being for society. And actually this contradicts with um, our view on democracy, which is more about compromise and about protecting the minorities and not this utilitaristic view. And I would be interested, um, yeah, if you could share your thoughts on this issue. Thank you. Shame. Yeah. Yeah, that's of course, yeah, that's of course you're mentioning very, very important points. And you are mentioning also uh, implicitly, if I'm not mistaken, a sort of confusion in the field. Because when they say that they are defending democracy, but it's not our idea of democracy. In, in the, so that's, you are absolutely right. That that's, uh, and well-being is not democracy, in a sense. Uh, we are, that's, uh, and efficiency is not uh, freedom. So, uh, no, of course, you are perfectly right. Uh, but the debate about democracy goes in other direction, which also include uh, the United States. And that's also a something which is not so much if it's well-being or not, but for example, the debate about the, the so-called filter bubble. That's a consequence of algorithm. That's a, if the, if the um, use of algorithm in public communication spreads, the algorithm work well, the idea also the consequence of what we say, are always personalized more and more and more and more individual. So we can, the result would be everybody can live in a personalized world which is extremely isolated. So if the algorithms are effective, they, they produce, they give me what I really want and shape my media world and my, my digital world according to my perspective, let's assume it works, but then, well, I'm alone in my personalized world. I have no contact with the uh, similar personalized world of other people. And that's, that's, well, the meaning of democracy would really change mm, similar world. We have Charlotte Hofmann in the first row, please. Um, you said that when uh, algorithms are successful, they partly produce the future they predict, and you used the example of shopping and predictive policing. I've been thinking of another example that, rises, that raises the question, how would you explain when algorithms are not successful. And I was thinking of the issue of micro-targeting, this new technique of identifying voters that, we, that uh, campaigners engage with. Uh, in 2004 and two, no, 2008 and 2012, people said, observers said that Obama won the elections because of these new techniques. And we were all amazed about the predictability of what would voters actually do. Would they vote yes or no, and who would they vote for? It seems these new techniques are brilliant at predicting the future. And in the least, in the last uh, recent election, they were suddenly not successful anymore. So if you say they produce the future they predict, were they unable to produce the future they predicted in the last event? Or would you sort of use another explanation for this? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Of course, and, and that's a great topic. Well, actually, um, well, 
what Obama used in the in 2008, what actually were micro targeting, which is not was not basically relying on algorithms. But the algorithms were used now in the, the 2016 American election. And the, for example, micro-targeting, apparently, one which used the, with success micro-targeting was Ted Cruz, who didn't want the primaries, but he was, well, from, we had this we had a huge range of uh, Republicans at the beginning, and he stood up for a while, much more than people expe expected, apparently because of a very focused use of micro-targeting. So apparently uh, these techniques are still useful, but I, but they don't, well, as we said, algorithms work, but even if they are right, they don't determine the thing, because as I said, what the basic background we're saying, social reality is much too complex for that. So uh, I, I'm fascinated to look at how, uh, with the data we have now about uh, the use of uh, micro target and how maybe in some cases they, f they were effective in with positive results or People react to that and produce something they are good they cannot predict. But also about that, the, the, the l l recent um, political debate were also affected by something even different than 2008, apparently it was not there. Uh, I'm thinking about research by Philip Hoffman, the people in Oxford, about the use of chatbots. So they were not there in 2008. And now apparently quite a lot was produced by chats with political uh, bots in the debate in the United States. And still we don't know how much they were effective, but apparently in Brexit and in Trump election, they were definitely active. So that's uh, something which sort of overlaps with micro-targeting. I think we're, <clears throat> just a moment please, uh, I saw you. I think we're going to switch to Twitter um, for a second and see what came in under the hashtag digital society. Um, my colleague needs a microphone in the first row. Please. Okay, so here's the first question that came up in the discussion also on uh, Facebook and Twitter. Is there a link uh, of the principles presented relating to prediction probabilities to the principles of quantum mechanics like from a theoretical viewpoint? That was one of the first questions. So. Interesting. Uh, another person was uh, interested to know how are our personal social media bubbles going to develop in the future if algorithms do not learn to learn? Another question. And then, is uh, artificial intelligence always goal-oriented? If so, it would have nothing to do with algor algorithmical prediction or algorithms are also related to that kind of intelligence? Those are three huge questions. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we can combine them into one, Elena. <laughs> but some can, I'm ashamed to say that some questions can be answered very quickly. About predictive analytics and quantum mechanics, actually I don't know. Uh, there's a, there are always a talks about quantum models, quantum computers in the field, but how this affects the predictive, uh, effective algorithm. I'm sure that people could say something about that, but I cannot, I'm <laughs> sorry. Um, I forgot the other, what was it then? The second the, one, the, can the, you the repeat second, the second one? There was about filter bubble. Yeah. And no, that's the third, bubble. right? Yeah. The, the second question was about social media bubbles and how are they going to develop in the future, as you said, if algorithms do not learn to learn. Yeah, but as, uh, partly I, I answered when we discussed the filter bubble uh, as in the other question. So, um, the filter bubble are there, they recognize as a problem, and uh, now they try, uh, well, you have everybody heard, um, um, Facebook uh, tries to, uh, to uh, use algorithm also to to sort of reduce the filter bubble effect. So you should have your um, news feed not only uh, relating to what you did before, but introduce a, some, a sample of sort of paradoxical planned serendipity in the way the algorithm works. So there's apparently some awareness of that. Uh, if it will work or not, we don't know. Uh, the third question was about You need a microphone, right? <laughs> the third question. <clears throat> yeah, is intelligence always goal-oriented? Artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. 
no. But uh, no, it was <laughs> no. But I remember the question was more um, had more context. No, what intelligence, of course, is not goal oriented. We are discussing about serendipity and the ability to learn from from uh, randomness, which is usually not goal oriented. But it's a little the problem if that's. I don't, well, if the question refers to that, um, algorithms tend to be goal oriented. I said algorithms learn um, focused tasks, and usually up to now they, are, uh, they have difficulty in generalizing it to other tasks. So, in a sense, that's a lack of flexibility in this, in this uh, uh, sense. There's the gentleman to my left, right, there you go. Hi, um, thanks for the interesting uh, discussion. I um, work in machine learning as a researcher and I'm quite uh, curious about some of the points you made. Uh, the first was regarding overfitting. Um, typically, regarding, sorry? Sorry, regarding overfitting. Typically, um, overfitting. 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 Okay. So typically, uh, uh, at least for practitioners, you, you keep out test set and a training set, so you avoid overfitting by being really careful about uh, the issues you mentioned. You have a test set and a holdout set so that you know the performance on data you haven't seen before in your training. So that protects you typically against overfitting. Also in uh, predictive analytics, uh, no, true, no rigorous practitioner would ever say that I'm going to predict this is going to happen. It's always a statistical or probabilistic interpretation. So this might happen or this person might eat an ice cream cone with 90% probability. So that being said, uh, I was really not sure about uh, the point you made about, uh, about uh, the potential drawbacks of predictive analytics because A, it's traditionally uh, common not to overfit. And secondly, it's sup you're supposed to be careful in not making any concrete claims because you can't on uh, on what the future is going to be. Assuming that the future data is pro is drawn from a similar distribution to the past data, then you make statistical claims, but never anything as solid as this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, no, very good question. Um, about these points. Well, overfitting, I know you're, you're perfectly right. People are aware of that and they try to, to deal with it. My point was not that they're not able to deal with that. My point is what, that, the, that the, the problems and the general attitude of machine learners are different from the one you have in statistics because overfitting is not the first problem you have if you make probabilistic calculus, but it's the main problem you have if you make machine learning. And of course, people are very well aware of that and they try to cope with it. But the first, well, they try to cope with it with partial solution and they're also aware that it's basically impossible to find the solution which works everywhere that you, you uh, avoid, you sort of cancel the problem of overfitting. Overfitting is always, as I said, the bugbear of machine learning, always a problem that of course they face, they deal with, but you cannot eliminate. And, but about your other point uh, that uh, people um, claim, uh, don't claim to predict with certainty but with a certain probability, you're, you're, again, you're perfectly right, but that's exactly the point because the, the difference is not that they claim to know 100% what will happen, but they, that they claim to, to uh, they focus on the individual, not on averages. So if you look at the average, you act in a different way. If you know that a particular individual is 90% likely to commit a crime or to, uh, to, um, um, to buy a product and so on, you act what you wouldn't do on average on the whole population. So you go to this person with 90% likely to buy your product and you offer your product. That's why uh, predictive analytics has, as I said, performative effect or performative consequence, which is much more than what you would have with statistical. Um, trends, and that's what makes the possible preemptive and the dangerous consequences of this kind of attitude different. Not that they claim they are hundred percent certain, but they they focus on someone specific. So we have about ten minutes, and I'm going to predict 
that we're going to end at 10 sharp. There was a gentleman before that in the fourth row, fourth in, to my um, left, and then it's your turn, gentleman in the second row, third row. Okay, Okay. I Go guess um, this would be maybe a fast question, so I might not use up all our time. You started in the beginning with the story of Oedipus and a kind of Greek or ancient idea of the future, which was something settled and fixed and so there was no change. The future was closed. It was the way it is. And then we have a, a modern idea. Okay, the future is open. Anything can happen. I'm American. I know I can be a millionaire tomorrow, maybe. Um, and I wondered if in all your research, and, and you mentioned many times in your talk about the amazing um, results of machine learning. And I just wondered, and maybe in a more, maybe this is a slightly personal question, but as your opinion about the openness of the future changed. Is for you the future radically open? Is it radically closed? Is it somewhere in the middle? Um, or another way to ask the question, and I guess this has sort of been in the talk, um, will the, are, are all these algorithms showing us that in fact the future is less open than we moderns thought? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. But again, it's a very good question. Uh, I think that the idea of the open future that anything can happen is uh, actually more a fantasy. It's not what the idea of the open future shows. Because the, the open future is just, you cannot predict the future because it depends on what we are doing today. But actually the future will be the result of today. So it's open, but not completely unstructured. It's not the future that's or anything. Everything that will happen in the future depends on what we do today. So it will be always connected with, with um, very, very strong constraints. Open doesn't mean completely without structure. Or rather the opposite. The future is open just because it's a result of our present action. Because it is structures that we cannot know how it will happen. But it won't be completely fantasy. Well, um, Shackle has a theory um, well, opposing imagination and fantasy, with imagination is what you can sort of produce for the future, starting from or how the future is surprising out of what would happen today, which is not complete randomness. Gentlemen, in the third row, to my right, to your left. So yes, uh, thank you for this lecture, which has very high philosophical impact. Uh, but I'm Alexander Spies from the Pirate Party, and I have a very special political question. Because uh, we have uh, two politicians in Berlin, Mr. Heilmann and Mr. Buschkowski, uh, who plan a complete surveillance of Berlin with 20,000 cameras, yes, and a software which can predict or which can report in time, uh, any crime to the police. Uh, what's, what will be your advisory for this, guys? Uh, be careful. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I wouldn't say these things are completely useless, actually. So it's, uh, but, uh, the, yeah. Uh, that what the meaning of my talk, that's, uh, yeah, that's, um, that they uh, have a lot of promises and they often fulfill the promises. But, Thereby, they don't necessarily solve the problems. They produce other problems. I would say, I don't know, I don't know the political situation, the political decisions are connected with so many other factors that, of course, it's not the point. But whatever you decide to do, be careful. Yep, there's another question or comment right there. Um, so we are talking about the digital society, and I would be interested in more this human aspect uh, of, of the topic. Um, so how the whole algorithmic landscape affects us as human beings? Uh, does it kind of change the impacts, the, the, the way uh, we think, uh, and uh, how it's going to develop, how we're going to develop as uh, as a society, uh, our interaction with the machine, and also what does it does really on this l deep uh, psychological level, how the algorithm affect us. Thank you. Well, we are closing with a huge question, of course, but uh, I just say something about it. Uh, what, uh, what worries me or less? Well, you say, will 
algorithm as a new media affect our way of being human beings or relating to one another? Of course they will. But by itself, it's not that they are entering a new world because, uh, well, we have always been affected by the media of our society. We couldn't think without. The way we think is heavily dependent on not only language, which is social, nobody invents language itself, so, but also by, by the, the possibility, by, by writing. Writing was a huge revolution, and by the printed press of mass media. The way we think, we think who you are, we reflect ourselves, we articulate our thoughts, how we can reflect and so on, is, is since ever always depended on media. And from this point of view, which is the basic to easy answer, of course, algorithm will change that, but that's something we know since, since ever. So the, um, a little more focused question is, uh, of course, with algorithm, there's the, the, the fear about whether the old discussion about the Turing test and the fear of the singularity and the idea or Catherine Hayes says we are, might be moving to a post-human society because for the first time, which was the, the privilege of human beings uh, dealing or producing information, now it's there are machines that can do that. And that's more on the point. That's, um, that's something which changed our way of being, being human, maybe in a deeper sense than what all media did. And, uh, well, of course, the debate is open. Uh, many people work in electronic theory, talk about uh, hybrids and so on. Uh, my inclination then is to think that, uh, well, I'm not worried about singularity at all. I'm not, I'm not interested about Turing test at all, because I've been, well, Turing test, well, a machine had, had passed the Turing test, they passed every day, every time, because people, we very often um, communicate with bots without without noticing it, when, when we book a, a plane, when we book, a, when, in many, many cases, when we play uh, video games and so on, many of our partners are actually bots, and we don't even know, we don't notice it, and in many cases, if, are, if not me, but digital natives, don't even care about it. So that's already going on, and, uh, and it's, that's not something that really scares me. But about the role of human beings, I have the impression at the discussion sort of uh, showed that the role of human beings remains in a different way but more and more fundamental. I don't have never had the impression that something's hybrids are not mixing the humans with the algorithm. Algorithm works work so effective because they use something which is completely different, which is the intelligence comes from human being. So algorithms are apparently intelligent because they are not because they are more similar to us, because they are more different from us. Which means that uh, I, I'm, I personally am not particularly worried about uh, human beings losing their identity. But of course, their relations become different. I have two small, um, very small closing questions um, on a more personal note, maybe. Well, one is a little bit more general, the second one is uh, personal. Um, when I said we're going to close this evening at 10 o'clock, I knew this was not going to be true. Um, I was taking into account my own sloppiness, and uh, I, I am Swiss, so three minutes late is a terrible problem for me, but I've learned to live with it. I've learned to take it into account. My own biological algorithm, so to speak, actually made a right prediction, although lying about it, uh, in public. So um, do we have to teach algorithm, algorithms something they are not very good at doing, at being imprecise, at being sloppy? Uh, at uh, making mistakes at the end. Sure, but that's a, an old problem. Uh, well, in a sense, if you think about uh, before our, our now new web-related uh, uh, world, the a big problem of, of a programming, uh, but well, I'm not an expert, I cannot program myself, but talk with people, was always produced like random generators, which is basically mm. the problem. How machines are, algorithms are built to be 
to not recognize random and to be reliable. A machine, we don't expect a machine to make a surprise. When a machine surprises us, we say it's broken, not it's creative. So machines... Uh, so as soon as, but, as it starts to behave intelligently, it's broken, actually, right? Well, it, the, well machines, according to our traditional idea of machines, mm. machines should be completely reliable, not surprising. Mm. If a machine is surprising, my, my, my car doesn't start. It's not creative, it's mm. broken. Actually. Mm. But now machines are doing something completely different. So we are trying trying to teach machine now to be. I was not trying to sell uh, I'm a little delay here as a creative act, so to speak. I was just saying that I was taking it into account mm -hmm. in the, to my own prediction, I guess, um, of the future. We had a, um, you know, a scientist of uh, communication theory here in January, <coughs> Christoph Neubacher. We talked a lot about social media, too. And, um, and then I asked him, well, but you don't seem to be very active on Facebook, uh, neither on your professional profile nor on your personal profile. And we had an interesting discussion, a closing discussion from there. Uh, since you've wrote about fashion already, uh, we've mentioned it a couple of times already, I'd like to ask, uh, do you do all your shopping online or do you still shop actually uh, out there in the street? Do you okay. sort of obfuscate your traces when you do shop uh, or don't you? Well, How do you handle that? Oh, that's, that's really on the personal level, but that, uh, well, actually, about fashion, that's true. I have been working on fashion. I'm very fascinated by the topic of fashion, but uh, what disappoints many people, I worked on fashion in the 17th century, <laughs> so I really don't know what's going on now. If it's Italian, what's going on on Armani and Gucci and Prada, I actually have very big an idea. So I, I can just observe what uh, uh, relates to fashion in the ancient meaning, but, uh, but this was not your question. But the real disappointing thing what I'm really ashamed of. Uh, I'm not on Facebook. <laughs> uh, generational, and we can talk about why. So I, I'm, I'm myself, uh, well, there's a general rule that sociology tends to repeat that one is fascinating by fields. So, so, so you know, sociology has the big advantage and the big um, liability that we can make research about everything because society, everything is society. And the people tend to choose the topics where one is particularly weak. <laughs> so I mean myself, I'm, I'm actually so uh, on, well, I can, of course, I'm in front of a computer every day uh, Sure. Uh, every time of the day, sure. but I'm not on Facebook, I'm not very active in social media, and uh, I'm not particularly interested in fashion, and if I buy something, I do it in shops. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so you don't but you don't a, base a, your, a, yeah. you don't base your shopping decisions on collaborative filtering, so to speak. Yeah, my, my fashion decisions are not big of a decision, and then they are not then, then on... on uh, I'm not quite sure to believe you 100% there, but it's definitely an interesting uh, and a personal closing notion of this evening. Um, I had the honor to present here, along with those two agencies, about the uh, um, uh, Bundeszentrale für politische Bildung und der Humboldt-Institut um, für Internet und Gesellschaft. Thank you very much for your attendance. There's a little buffet now and some drinks we're having, and thank Thank you very much for coming all the way up from Thank Bologna. You. Elena Thank Esposito. You Thank you very much to everyone.